to reflect this this wonderful new name for his team, he decided to change the the team's colors completely. The first few years, the team's colors were a bit drab. It was like a, like a dark forest green and uh, nice uniforms, but maybe a little on the drab side. And Finley, who loved gold and green and white, needed to have that the same combination on the Oakland Athletics uniforms. He had to have that on his California Golden Seals. And so this was what the uniforms looked like, and they stood out like a sore thumb no matter where they went. These were color schemes that had a color scheme that had never been seen before in professional hockey. But that was his idea of turning the franchise around and giving this flashy new name, these flashy new uniforms, not to mention green and gold skates that first year. And it didn't take very long for the rest of the league to really ridicule the, the Seals and their poor players for these awful uniforms they had to wear. Welcome to Good Seats Still Available, a curious little podcast devoted to exploring what used to be in professional sports. Here's your host, Tim Hanlon. Hey, gang, how are you? Tim Hanlon here, as uh, announced, and uh, your humble and congenial host for what we call Good Seats Still Available, that curious little podcast that is devoted to, of course, what used to be in professional sports. Uh, We have finally returned to the sport of hockey, uh, which was our very first episode with our friend Mark Gretschmel, uh, who created the uh, documentary about the California Golden Seals, uh, which, of course, is still available on iTunes. If you go to our website at goodseatsstillavailable.com and you search for that first episode, you will find a convenient link uh, to purchase uh, said film. Uh, And uh, we are going to return to hockey and the California Golden Seals again uh, because uh, our uh, guest today is Steve Currier. Uh, who has just uh, written a tremendous uh, book, tome, uh, called The California Golden Seals, A Tale of White Skates, Red Ink, and One of the NHL's Most Outlandish Teams. Uh, It is published by the uh, University of Nebraska Press, and it is an impressive-looking book. Uh, It's about 464 pages, uh, but don't let that intimidate you. It is a very fun read. Uh, It's easy on the eyes. Uh, some great photography in here. Uh, It's a very professionally uh, done book. And is a uh, beautiful compliment to that uh, to that uh, documentary that Mark did and that we talked about. So rest assured, we will get into hockey on a much more uh, varied and deep basis uh, in episodes to come. Uh, and uh, you know, there's clearly lots of uh, of stories to be had about some of the early NHL teams and uh, the later NHL teams, and certainly the World Hockey Association, et cetera. Uh, we will indeed get to those, but uh, some of these. Uh, conversations are dictated by uh, promotional efforts and the availability of certain guests and uh, projects that they're working on. And this one uh, is um, no exception. Steve Courier has been uh, uh, documenting a lot of uh, of his uh, journey into writing this book on his uh, on his website. And uh, and the book, is, of course, now is finally out. So we wanted to uh, take advantage of the launch of this book uh, around this week. We're recording this the first week of November. Uh, when the book is actually out and uh, available to uh, to have a conversation with him and go deeper into our our uh, exploration of uh, of a team that uh, continues to confound uh, and is uniquely um, you know uh, a team that um, uh, stands out uh, in the uh, the history of of professional hockey in the United States as um, as one of uh, I don't know if it's woe as much as it is of just uh, curiosity uh, in terms of uh, or bad luck or. Just uh, unique uh, situations and things that happen to this team on an ongoing basis that just makes for uh, just uh, unending fodder, I think. And uh, that's our conversation uh, with Steve Courier uh, in just a couple of seconds. Uh, We uh, will promote at this juncture our uh, relationship and our friends at uh, at Audible. Uh, As you know, Audible uh, is our... uh, our sponsor for quite some time and uh, is the king of audiobooks. And uh, if you want to give an audiobook a try, uh, Audible and its service is the best place and manner in which to do so. Uh, and I encourage you, of course, to go to audibletrial.com slash good seats to get yours, if you will, that your free audiobook download and uh, about 30 days a month's worth of the Audible service uh, as a, a free gratis trial uh, of uh of Audible and uh, and audiobooks. It's great. Uh, you know, there's almost, uh, I think, closing in now on 190,000 titles uh, across all kinds of genres and stuff. And uh, I love audiobooks. It's awesome. They're awesome. And um, I dare you not to find a title uh, that's worthy of your time uh, to try 
uh, the service. Gets it to audibletrial.com slash good seats for your free audiobook download and free months worth of the Audible audiobook service. And uh, we appreciate you giving them a try. And we certainly thank Audible for their continuing support uh, of our little podcast here. All right. So that's out of the way. Thank you again for listening thus far. And uh, now let us uh, move on to our chat uh, with author Steve Courier, uh, live and exclusive from uh, the uh, northern uh, wilds of uh, Canada. Uh, And we're going to be talking about the California Golden Seals yet again uh, and some more uh, interesting tidbits uh, to come. Uh, Enjoy. Look, you know, our our very first episode uh, of this little podcast journey was about uh, six months ago or so. And uh, as you know, was uh, with uh, Mark Gretschmel. Uh, and uh, we talked yeah. about uh, the very topic we're going to be uh, going back to again today. And it's frankly been our only conversation in and around uh, the realm of uh, pro hockey thus far. Uh, that's not because we haven't uh, uh, known about the WHA or some of these other teams and leagues that uh, uh, it sort of came and went. Uh, but it just so it's just very interesting to sort of see uh, how this particular team uh, seems to be uh, in the consciousness of a lot of folks in both the past sort of hockey history, but also in today's current. And um, I, I don't know if, 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 why this particular team is so unique, um, but I guess maybe a good place to start would be kind of how you stumbled across the story in the first place, especially uh, on page 374 in your book, which I'm going to read in a minute, uh, you were never really a fan of the team directly yourself. That's correct. Um, because I was, I was actually born in 79, so a year after the team uh, ultimately folded. Um, so I, I never saw them play. Um, even the players that were in the league uh, beyond 1979, there were, only, there were only a few in the 1980s that were still around whenever I started getting into hockey. I didn't really get into hockey until about maybe 1987 or 88 or so. Um, so there were a few guys that were left in the league, but not a, not a whole lot. And um, so what really got me into the, the team, there was a, a couple of little things, just little tidbits, I guess, that I kind of ran into as I, I grew up. Um, I remember very distinctly one of the first... Uh, the first exposure I got to the team was um, a magazine that uh, I think my father must have bought it for me because I don't I, I didn't have any money in my own at the time I was only about maybe uh, nine years old and uh, it was a, an issue of Hockey Illustrated and in the issue they happened to be talking about the 20th anniversary of expansion which was in 1967 and uh, and uh, this was a this magazine was about 19 I think it was May 1988 or something like that it was in the playoffs um, and uh, in this article on expansion, there was a, a large photo of one of the SEALs players in, in black and white, and he's wearing the, the, the road uniform, and it was just a very intriguing and different-looking uniform. It looked very, very, really cool, um, like nothing that was around the NHL in, in, in the 80s, and I think that was it kind of planted the seed. There, there was that moment, but um, around the same time, there was also, I was collecting a lot of sticker books as, as, a, as a kid. And in the sticker books, you'd see a couple little mentions here and there about the Seals um, and some of the players who were still in the league at the time. And it was just my natural curiosity, I think. I just wanted to know what this team was about. And it just it, it, it kind of started from there, I think. And a few years later, when I started getting older and I had my own money and I was able to go to card shops and card shows and, and I'd see um, different photos and, and memorabilia for the team, it just kind of grew from there. And when I got a little bit older, about maybe 11 or 12, I thought it might have been yeah, 11 or 12 or so, um, I kind of naively wrote to the NHL head office in New York, and uh, I'd asked them just for information, very generally, just information and team records on all the defunct franchises from uh, that period, so the Atlanta Flames and the um, Kansas City Scouts and the Colorado Rockies and, and all those other teams, and someone at the league office sent me um, a photocopy of the entire 1975-76 SEALs media guide. And in that, I, I had all the information I could possibly want on the team. It was just sitting right there in front of me. 
Um, and I think that kind of really got the ball rolling because I had so much at my fingertips and I, I used to study that media guide uh, almost on a daily basis. I'd bring it to school and whenever I finished my work, I'd be looking over it and seeing all of these um, interesting and unfamiliar names like you know Ted Hampson and Joey Johnson and Dave Herekesi and Norm Ferguson and uh, these names that just weren't familiar to me at all. But um, just looking through their records and um, and seeing how much this team struggled over the years was just very fascinating to me. Uh, for some really odd reason, it's um, that media guy is probably still the greatest piece of mail I've ever received. It's uh, I still have it. It's something that uh, it's become very precious in in, a, in, a, in an odd sort of way. It's just a bunch of paper, but it uh, it became very very important to me. And um, it was really that that got the ball rolling, I think. And um, I kind of wonder if someone at the NHL office had sent me a media guide of the Atlanta Flames, for example, or the Kansas City Scouts, I might have been writing a book about them instead of the Seals. So it, it, it was kind of just luck that it just fell into my lap like that. Well, I, that's also interesting, too, because given that time, obviously, there was this thing called the WHA, right, with all these other sort of fledgling teams and, and frankly, even probably more wild and woolly uh, stories uh, outside of the NHL with its uh, at least aura of stability. Um, surprised that uh, you didn't stumble into some rat holes of uh, of some of those uh, long lost franchises as well. Yeah, there was a, uh, the, the WHA also really interested me a lot too. But um, it was I think it was much harder to find information at the time uh, um, on the, on the World Hockey Association. There wasn't I mean this is before the internet was around so. Um, and there weren't a lot of books on the WHA at the time, or, or even a lot of franchises from that time. There wasn't a lot available. Um, so that became a bit of an interest of mine as well a bit later. Like, I, I love reading about defunct franchises and the uh, and seeing all these old, um, very strangely colored uniforms. And uh, um, it, it, it's a very interesting part of hockey history, I find, in the 1960s and 70s. And uh, But at the time, I, I just didn't have the... Um, the resources at my fingertips like I do now, but uh, if I had, I, there's a very good chance I might have gone down that that, that direction as well. So uh, okay, so you 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 found a team uh, despite not being uh, an actual fan uh, and having seen their games that piqued your interest. So how do you take that next step of like I think I'm going to do something that's a little bit more reverential and and historical and and mem- memorial of of this franchise. Uh, both on the web as well as this idea to uh, to write what became a 464 page book, which we're going to talk about and promote, of course. Uh, the book actually started, I would say, whenever I got that media guide. It was around that moment where I um, I just started kind of putting out some really rough ideas. So even when I was 11 or 12, I was I always had an interest in in writing. And it, it just seemed like a very fascinating topic that, uh, again, like I hadn't seen anything anywhere. There was, there was never more than a couple of sentences in any books about the seals. There was really nothing out there. Um, so even as a, as a kid, I think I just realized that it was, a, it was, a, it was an interesting topic um, that no one really knew much about. And it just kind of got the ball rolling from there. And I just sort of picked at it for years and years. And as I got a bit older in high school, it, the book just got longer and longer. Uh, by the time I got to university, then it had taken on um, the proportion of a real book. And when I graduated from university, and by this point, the Internet was, was available, and it was so much easier to find articles online and um, ways of filling in the gaps that I, I'd had over the years. Um, I was also able to connect with players um, uh, through the NHL Alumni Association, through um, other historians I'd met over the, over the years. Um, it just kind of mushroomed from there until uh, I just... I just felt that um, I had the entire history. It was complete, and I thought, well, this is the point. I think I should probably um, submit it to a couple of publishers and see what they think, if this is even a feasible idea or not to, to, to publish the, the book. Um, but originally, um, which is um, maybe a bit hard to believe, but the original version of this book was far longer than 460, 464 pages. It was probably closer to somewhere like seven or 800 pages if you consider all the statistics and the 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 not the, the game summaries, just very very short game summaries, but uh, I want to put almost the entire media guide's worth of records in the book itself. Um, that ultimately, I was told, was a bit unfeasible, and I I understand why now. Um, so that's all on the website now. It's uh, the website was a way of of keeping all that extra research that I had done. Uh, and not letting it go to waste, I was able to just put it on the website and uh, to, to create a complete history of the franchise. There's the book and the website uh, um, is also there to help out on that. 
Well, uh, the, the the book is, uh, and I, I've I've been thumbing through uh, a copy, an advanced copy. It, it's a gorgeous looking book, right? The colors and the uh, the photography and all that. Uh, it's called the California Golden Seals: A Tale of White Skates, Red Ink, and One of the NHL's Most Outlandish Teams. And I'll, don't let the uh, size of the book um, uh, fool or intimidate you. Um, it's a fun read, and uh, it, it reads very easily. Um, and uh, I think the stats and the photos and stuff are, are just are very well placed, well edited. Um, and it's 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 just fascinating. I mean, you know, the idea that you can go so deep on a team that only lasted about nine seasons or so, uh, yet also reveal some very uh, rich, not only anecdotal uh, oddities, I guess, but also, frankly, uh, uh, some of the things that uh, why uh, the story was important writ large against the larger tableau of the NHL and its history. Um, I think is is uh, uh, admirable, uh, fascinating, and maybe obviously a bit. Uh, uh, questionable in terms of sanity, but it, it's a fun read. Um, and I guess I guess I would love to maybe kind of maybe we can circle around um, maybe sort of uh, a, a bit of the seals uh, coming into existence. You you alluded to it before. I think um, I think we, we when we talked about it with with Mark back in our first episode, uh, it was called the Great Expansion. And maybe that's a good place to start in 1967 as to what the hell that was and and why the SEALs came into existence because of it. Well, there's, there's a lot of reasons why the SEALs came into existence. There was, um, um, you almost have to look at other sports at the time as well, um, especially professional baseball, professional football, um, which have a bit of an influence on how the SEALs came into being. Um, baseball, hockey, and football, as you know, were, uh, uh, were more Eastern-based, uh, had more Eastern-based professional leagues. Uh, so in baseball, there were no teams that were really west of Chicago or St. Louis at, 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 um, at a certain time. Um, football was the same way. It was very Eastern, maybe Midwestern-based. Uh, and then gradually in, in baseball, I think they, they were one of the first leagues to take that big step, and they moved a few teams to the West Coast. You had the, uh, the Brooklyn Dodgers moved, and... Uh, um, the um, New York Giants moved to San Francisco. Uh, the Washington Senators ended up moving to Minnesota at one point. Um, so they were starting to expand west. And football as well was um, getting the idea of, at the very least, starting a second uh, professional league, the American Football League, uh, to compete with the National Football League. Um, so these, these leagues that had been around for a long time were starting to expand and were um, exploring different markets. And around the same time, the NHL... Um, had offers to expand to Cleveland, but uh, in the end they decided not to. Um, they'd always turned down these expansion offers uh, to keep it a very regional-based league. They had teams in just Montreal, Toronto, Boston, Chicago, um, Detroit, and um, uh, New York. Um, so th they want to keep the, the league to be very regional, Eastern-based, um, but around the same time you have this other league, this Western Hockey League that was um, had been established um, quite a few years uh, before, a minor league, uh, mind you, but they were starting to get a bit bigger as well by the 1960s. And around the early 60s, they started putting teams in Vancouver and, more importantly, in San Francisco and Los Angeles. Um, not to mention a few years after that, teams in Edmonton, Calgary, Denver. Um, there were some major markets that they were exploring in this Western Hockey League. Hmm. Um, and eventually they decided they, to, they were making some little threats to the NHL saying, you know what, like, we don't like being uh, your feeder league. We're going to go on our own and we're going to become our own league. Um, and the NHL, upon hearing this, may have panicked a little bit and decided this might be the time we need to expand and uh, snuff out this threat before it becomes real. Uh, because this Western League, they do have some major markets, um, and they can compete with us. Um, so the NHL decided to accept new teams, um, including Los Angeles and San Francisco, um, St. Louis and uh, uh, Minnesota and Pittsburgh and Philadelphia. Uh, not, um, and around this time, the NHL also signed a television contract with uh, CBS, and the CBS contract called for teams in Los Angeles and San Francisco. So that's one of the reasons why the NHL decided to, to expand to California is because their TV contract, which is very important to them, dictated that they need to have teams in those two um, markets. 
um, ultimately one turned out to be a very, very good idea. The other one, not so much, which would be the, the Bay Area, um, at least in, in the short term, it didn't work out quite so well. But uh, um, at the time, it seemed like it was a very good idea because of the success the SEALs had had in the Western Hockey League in, the, in San Francisco uh, throughout the 60s. Um, it certainly seemed like a very wise idea, but in the end, um, and for reasons we're going to go into later on, I'm sure, um, it didn't quite work out that way. All right, well, let's, let's talk about it. So the WHL had a team in San Francisco called the Seals. Uh, they played at uh, the Cow Palace, still around, the venerable Cow Palace, uh, and uh, a, a venue that uh, continues to cross our radar on a number of different uh, episodes. Uh, by the time this one airs, we will have had a... Uh, a conversation with uh, Paul Child, formerly of the uh, old San Jose Earthquakes, and and his stories about uh, uh, the uh, beginnings of indoor soccer with the NASL in the Cow Palace. Uh, but maybe you want to kind of give some, uh, uh, I guess, a little bit of background about that, the fact that this team existed. And I guess the guy awarded the expansion franchise for the NHL in San Francisco, Barry Van, Van Gerberg, uh, decided instead of, I guess, taking a, a pure new franchise, I guess his thought was, let's buy the team in the WHL and convert it. Was that kind of the approach? Yeah, and it wasn't a bad idea necessarily because the Seals had been one of the more successful Western League teams at the time. They they won. Uh, they, they came into existence in sixty one, sixty two uh, as an expansion team, and had a pretty decent first year. They made the playoffs their first year. Uh, they got swept out in the first round, but they played pretty well. By year two, all of a sudden, the Seals had become good enough to actually win the championship. And they repeated the following season as well. So they had two championships in their first three seasons. And especially during those two playoff years, there was a, a good reason to think San Francisco could um, host an NHL team because they were selling out uh, the, the Cow Palace on a regular basis, um, selling out uh, getting 10, 11,000 people per game uh, during the playoffs. And uh, there was a lot of enthusiasm for this team in San Francisco. Uh, it made perfect sense for, uh, for um, Barry Van Gerbeek to, to buy the Seals. Uh, when the NHL decided they wanted to put a team there, it, it made perfect sense. Um, but uh, in the end, the, the problem was the Cow Palace wasn't really considered to be a, a, a decent option for the NHL. It, was, um, it wasn't very big. It was an old rink, even at the time. Um, it smelled like cows because they used to have rodeos and, and uh, all sorts of cattle auctions and things like that at the, uh, at the, at, at the rink. Um, so it, it really wasn't an NHL caliber rink. It didn't have very good sight lines as well. It was a, um, it was a very clunky old arena, and uh, it wasn't really NHL appropriate. So um, the city of Oakland was building a new rink, a uh, brand-new state-of-the-art rink, uh, to be ready for ni- the 1966-67 season. So when Barry Van Gerbeek, um, he received the franchise uh, before that, um, when he bought the Seals, he decided, while well, this new rink is coming in in Oakland, this might be the perfect opportunity for us. Uh, we'll just move right across the bay. Uh, you know, it's a few miles away. It shouldn't make a big difference. We'll just put the team here, and uh, we'll have a state-of-the-art rink. We'll have the nicest rink in the NHL. Uh, this is going to be fantastic. But what he didn't count on was the fact that there were not really a lot of hockey fans in Oakland. The hockey fans were all in San Francisco and in San Jose, which is the reason why the San Jose Sharks are doing so well today. The hockey fans are in that part of the Bay Area. So he was expecting, and his other investors as well were expecting, those fans to just cross the bridge over into Oakland and everything would be fine. But there's a bit of a psychological barrier apparently in in the Bay Area where um, San Francisco and Oakland, they really like to separate themselves from each other. Oakland is uh, a very blue-collar town, um, at the time, it had a, didn't have a great reputation. It had a lot of crime. San Francisco, on the other hand, is some people would say maybe it's it was a bit smug, uh, a little a little overly sophisticated, and uh, it just didn't they just didn't seem to get along very well. And fans in San Francisco just didn't want to cross that bridge into Oakland uh, to watch the team play. So in the end, the Seals ultimately were doomed to failure pretty much from day one just because they put the team in, uh, in Oakland instead of San Francisco. Um, it was a nice, beautiful rink, but no one was going to go uh, watch a game down there. Yeah, there, there's, a, there's a great quote in, uh, in your book uh, that you have from uh, Len Shapiro. He says, there's a famous line, the San Francisco Bay Bridge is 10 miles from Oakland to San Francisco, and from San Francisco to Oakland, it's 1,000 miles. 
uh, probably a, a good synopsis of, of sort of that uh, of the sort of that scenario. But uh, OK, but, uh, you know, all right. So at least it's it's still even before, you know, that that's that sort of plays itself out. Um, so help me out on the names, because because Mark and I dan- did a little dance around this uh, uh, in our first conversation. They were um, they were the San Francisco Seals. But I, I it, it is in my, in my understanding that they were renamed the California Seals in their last year of the WHL. And that was the name that at least was begun when they started in the NHL in 67, 68. Is that right? Yeah, that's correct. Yeah, they were the San Francisco Seals for the first five years they were in the league. And the the understanding, or at least the, the logic behind it, was they felt uh, when, when Barry Van Gerbig uh, officially bought the team uh, and they were preparing to go to the NHL, they said, well, we're not going to be in San Francisco anymore. We're, we're moving to Oakland, but Oakland at the time didn't really have this major league um, reputation, I guess. And it seems kind of silly because now you have uh, major league teams in Oakland. Uh, you have the Athletics and uh, you have the, the Raiders. And um, there, there's teams that have the Oakland name. But at the time, it was seen as being uh, maybe a, a second-class city of San Francisco. So they decided that for that reason, we'll call it in the California Seals. Not only that, it's also a way of maybe inviting the fans from San Francisco because it's not the Oakland Seals, it's the California Seals. So we want you to come over the bridge uh, and watch these games. But in the end, the fans of San Francisco were insulted because the team was already called San Francisco Seals, and now they're, they're changing the name on them. They became a little upset. It might have been one of the reasons why um, they didn't want to go to the game. They felt that their team had been taken away uh, and moved to a different city, and, uh, and the NHL, for some reason, um, I think while well, the fans might have believed that what, you don't want to call us the San Francisco Seals? Is there something wrong with us or something? And uh, that might have been one of the reasons it's uh, been said that uh, it could be one of the reasons why the team didn't succeed as well and why they could attract fans because they were, at first they were kind of between the, the two cities. It seems like uh, there was no uh, uh, no headquarters at first. And it wasn't until during the, the first NHL season, about 25 games in, they decided into the Oakland Seals hoping to reverse that negative attendance trend but it never worked yeah i mean um okay so you know i i'm I'm framing this through sort of i guess the modern day lens of the nhl and sports marketing right which is dangerous because this is we're really talking about 1967 but how do you how does that work right you're 25 games into the season you're in a new league you've expanded the league has expanded it's got you know it's got a, a, a ostensibly the first national footprint including a national television contract and one of your franchises actually changes its name in the middle of the season, not before the season, not after the season, but literally 25 games into it. Um, that sounds like a recipe for chaos. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you would never say anything like that these days. Um, it's And not only did the Seals do it once, they did it a second time a few years down the road. Um, so it, it just shows what, what kind of chaos was going on uh, with this team right from the get-go. It... Uh, Nothing seemed to go right with this team, no matter how well it seemed to be organized. And in a lot of ways, it was very well organized, or at least it seemed it was well organized. But there was all of these um, these decisions that were made that just turned out to be just laughable or uh, just chaotic in, in the long run or even in the short run. Um, and that was one of them, certainly. All right. Well, so maybe let's maybe we could just sort of describe maybe to the best of your ability that first season, right? So besides the name change and the uh, seemingly immediate identity crisis right out of the box. Um, clearly not the best team in the league, right? 15 wins uh, uh, out of 74 games played, right? Probably to be uh, expected. Although, uh, based on my reading of this, uh, uh, the team in its first year had quite a few of the old WHL San Francisco Seals players. So, or Cal- the, the last season was California Seals WHL, but uh, you'd think there'd be at least some level of consistency, but that doesn't seem to have translated into a successful first season on the rink. Yeah, there were, there were a few Western League players that ended up making the transition. Um, I talked to uh, one player, his name is Tom Thirlby. He was um, a defenseman for the Seals for the, their entire six years in the Western League, and he was one of the players who was, um, his, his contract was, was bought by the uh, uh, the Van Gerbig group. Uh, so he was invited to training camp. Uh, he ultimately made the team only played about 20 games or so, but he had said that uh, during training camp, the Western League guys, according to him, were just, they were just there for, for practice. They weren't, 
um, they were just there to uh, provide some opposition for the, the NHL guys who were drafted in the, in the expansion draft. Um, so they were there, but not a lot were expected to actually make the team. A few of them did, like Thurlby was one, Charlie Burns made the team as well. Um, Jerry Odrowski is uh, another guy who, who made the transition. Um, but there weren't a lot of Western League players that made it, uh, just a few, and they weren't really any of the main players. Um, one of the reasons why the team, I believe, was not very successful the first year was um, even though they drafted a lot of pretty decent players in the, uh, in, in the expansion draft, they concentrated a lot on, on defense. So they had two very good goalies. They had some uh, very good de- defensemen who could, uh, you know, who could handle themselves, but they didn't have much uh, forward. And in the end, they really couldn't score a lot of goals. And that was one of the things that, that uh, set them apart from the other teams. Their defense was about as good as every other team in, in the, uh, the West, in the, in the, the expansion division. Um, but um, they just didn't have anyone who could really put the puck in the net. Most of the other expansion teams ended up getting, maybe they got lucky, but everyone seemed to have gotten one or two guys who just kind of stood out and was able to score 25 or 30 goals. Uh, the Seals never really had that uh, that kind of player. And ultimately, they they just couldn't score any goals. So no matter how many times they only gave up one or two goals, it seemed like they were, they were losing a lot against one nothing and 2-1. Um, they just didn't have the offensive talent to compete with the other teams, but that was also the, the reason. That, that's that's also because they they drafted the way they did. Um, they could have gone many different routes. They could have gone for more veterans who had some uh, um, some scoring ability, but in the end, they went for veterans who had defensive ability. And while that's um, certainly uh, it, it makes sense to do that, um, in the end, they just didn't have any scoring. Well, uh, Bert Olmsted was the uh, general manager that first year, but um, uh, and and obviously, well, he only lasted a season in that role. But I think it's also an interesting uh, uh, asterisk here, uh, which we kind of glossed over. Uh, their first general manager, uh, a guy named as a Rudy Rudy Pilius Pilius Pilius, um, he was fired Rudy actually. Pilius. Yeah, so he actually was fired or, or let go before the beginning of the actual season. So there's another sort of wrinkle of. Uh, disruption, I guess, even before uh, they hit the ice. Uh, that that can't be a real great confidence booster as you're trying to kind of get your toehold in, in your first play in the NHL. Yeah, the, um, see, I was talking to Tim Ryan, who is, uh, he was a broadcaster on CBS, but he was also uh, involved with the SEALs. Uh, he did their broadcasting and some public relations. Uh, and, and he had told me that... Um, uh, Bert Olmsted had saw Rudy Phillips as being a bit of a buffoon. He just didn't, uh, he just didn't think that they would be able to, to get along and to, uh, to work together. Phillips had been hired the year before. He was a general manager and coach during their last Western League season. Um, but, and he was supposed to continue in that role uh, in the NHL. And then he decided he didn't want to be the coach, uh, or he was maybe forced out as, as coach. Uh, but he was still on as general manager, and he was there at the expansion draft helping make uh, player selections. And in a lot of books, it says that it was Olmsted who, who selected the players. And the reason why the team was so bad is because he didn't have the time to prepare himself. He, he got the job, and a few weeks later, he was um, picking uh, his team. He was there, but he was not the general manager. It was really close. who was still general manager at the time. Olmsted was there to, to advise him. Um, and then shortly after the expansion draft, um, Olmsted said, look, it's either me or him. Um, I'm, I can't work with Rudy Pillis for, for whichever reason. It was never really made clear. Um, but he said, uh, you know, it's either him or me. And they decided to go with Olmstead and let Rudy Pillis go, which didn't work out well for the Seals. Pillis ended up suing the team. Um, Olmstead became general manager and coach. And by the record, we can see that it wasn't really a great uh, decision to have him uh, behind the bench. He had great credentials as an NHL player. He's a Hall of Famer. He was... Uh, he won out of how many Stanley Cups? So probably six or seven with uh, with Montreal and Toronto. Um, like everything pointed at him being a good choice, but he had been a very very strict taskmaster in, uh, in in other coaching jobs that he had in the minor leagues, and there had been conflicts with players who were maybe a little on the softer side, who didn't want to play that aggressive game that he was used to playing. And with the Seals, it was the same thing. He wanted players to play in the Bert Olmsted mold, but most of them didn't have that ability um, or the desire because it just wasn't in their nature. A player like Billy Harris, for example, who was uh, a very talented player, had many great years with, with the Toronto Police, 
but he wasn't an aggressive player, and he just didn't get along with Bert Olmsted. Um, and Olmsted it seemed like he wanted his players to be in that uh, in that mold, that, that aggressive Bert Olmsted type player. They just weren't good enough to be like that. They weren't Hall of Famers like he was. Uh, and so there was a lot of conflict with the team. Um, he, he right off the bat was disappointed in them because they weren't winning right, uh, their in their um, preseason games. And so when they weren't winning, he always believed that uh, there, was, there was something wrong with them that they weren't putting out enough effort, and they should be, um, you know, just thanking the, the the hockey gods for giving the second chance at playing on an expansion team and continuing their careers, which in some cases were, they were pretty much over. Um, and he just couldn't understand that. So there was a lot of conflict uh, between Olmsted and, and a lot of the players. And finally, before the season even ended, maybe 20, 25 games left in the season, um, he just decided to hand the reins to his assistant coach, uh, Gordy Fashaway. Um, and um, I, I believe the famous quote he said, he had to, to leave the bench to, to save his sanity. He just couldn't take it anymore. He just um, wasn't able to whip these guys into shape. And... He uh, he ultimately was never going to be able to because these players were not really in the same mold as he was, and uh, ultimately he decided to, that coaching wasn't for him, and he never coached again in the NHL. Well, uh, evidenced by the fact that uh, apparently only seven of the twenty players from that team uh, uh, came back for the next season. Um, you know, maybe we we'll talk about sort of the transition from that first season to the second season because, uh, as you alluded to. Um, the uh, team actually made uh, the playoffs in the next two seasons, the only times they ever did. Uh, and in the case of uh, the 68-69 season, their second season, uh, they oh, just about doubled their winning uh, games won, right? So they won 15 games their first season. Uh, they were up to 29 wins in their second season. They finished actually second in the Western uh, Division, losing in the quarterfinals to their, I guess, artificial uh, yet real arch rivals, the Kings. Uh, in the playoffs. So that's, you know, in relative terms, that's a pretty that's a pretty good rebound, I guess, from a woeful and chaotic first season. Uh, is there anything in particular that you can attribute that sort of, I guess you could call it a rebound to? Well, I think what happened after the first season, they realized that there was a lot of issues with this team. Uh, one of them, as I mentioned before, was the lack of scoring. They just didn't have any of the first year. Um, coaching was definitely a problem. Um, Olmstead just uh, wasn't the right fit. And uh, Gordy Fashaway neither wasn't uh, the right fit. So they were both uh, let go. Uh, Olmstead didn't return as general manager the second season. They, um, Frank Selke Jr. Uh, ended up moving up into to that position um, for that season. And um, they brought in Bill Torrey as well, who, uh, of course, later on became general manager of the New York Islanders, and they won all those Stanley Cups. Uh, and they also brought in Fred Glover, who was the um, um, an American Hockey League legend, one of the greatest all-time scorers they've ever had. Um, and uh, he came in as, as coach. And the three of them transformed the team. They... Um, they, they brought in a lot of players, um, a couple of guys from the, the American League who had some potential. Uh, they made a few trades as, as well. They retained a few of the guys from the year before. They retained uh, Bill Hickey, for example, who had uh, led the team in, with 21 goals the first year. They kept him. Uh, they also kept Ted Hampson, who had been brought in in midseason. Um, he came in uh, um, in the middle of the 67-68 season and uh, scored almost a point a game pace for the, the 30-40 games he played. And uh, so they retained him, and uh, they also brought in players like Norm Ferguson from the American League. Uh, they made a trade for uh, Gary Jarrett, who came in from Detroit. Um, and uh, um, those guys ultimately had um, a, a pretty good string of success during that season. Um, one of the reasons why they were very successful that second season was everyone had a career year all at the same time, which we often see in, uh, in, in different sports. When everyone has a career year, the team uh, has great success, but in the end, they're not going to continue having that success year after year, and that's what happened with the Seals. Their first year, everyone hit career highs. The second, uh, the, the 69 70 season, they made the playoffs, but they made it by the skin of their teeth because everyone had regressed a little bit, um, or in some cases, a lot. And so these new players that came in and had a new enthusiasm, they were, they were a younger team, they were hungry, they were aggressive. By the, the 69-70 season, that aggression 
had disappeared and the scoring disappeared. And even though they still made the playoffs, they weren't really as successful a team as they had been the year before. All right. So shaky, uh, some glimpses or glimmers of, of success, of opportunity, of uh, playoff uh, 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 success and, and, uh, and, uh, and, and upward movement. Uh, but against a backdrop of, I'm guessing, uh, an underwhelming uh, draw at the gate and seemingly uh, almost relatively early into the whole franchise's existence, about maybe two years in, Van Gerbig essentially threatening to move on a somewhat constant or seemingly constant basis. Do you want to give us some background of sort of the backdrop of all this, despite the you know, uh, seeming glimpses of success on the ice uh, behind the scenes? Yeah, Van Gerby, he realized pretty quickly that um, he'd made a monumental mistake in um, investing in this team. Um, Frank Selke Jr., when I talked to him, he had said that, uh, you know, himself included, he'd said, it seemed like only an expansion was a license to print money. And the, the, a lot of the expansion teams were making these silly mistakes, and uh, they just thought this was going to be a great opportunity. We're going to join the NHL. We're going to make tons of money like uh, all the other franchises. And he realized, Barry Van Gerbe realized very quickly that uh, this wasn't going to be the case. His investors, when he started asking them for money to, to help him pay these bills, once attendance started to tank, um, his investors started dropping it one by one, and he realized this is a, a terrible investment for me to be in. I've got to get out of this uh, this thing. So before the first season had ended, he was already trying to sell a team to uh, Labatt's uh, Brewery in Vancouver, who didn't have a team at the time. Um, and then the following year, he uh, also tried to unload the team to the Knox brothers, uh, uh, Seymour and Northrop, uh, who were in Buffalo. And in the end, the NHL... Um, the other NHL owners decided, no, we're not going to let you move. Um, we need a team in Oakland because otherwise if the seals are gone, the LA Kings are by themselves on the West coast. There needs to be a, there needs to be a bit more of a balance. So they were always, they was, was always unable to move the team. Um, even though he was losing money left, right and center, it wasn't really until 1970 when Charlie Finley came along showing an interest in the team, he decided he was going to buy the team and keep it in Oakland, and Van Gerbig finally was able to rid himself of, of the Seals um, and pass on to uh, Charlie Finley. All right, well, let's, let's back up for a second, and we'll get to Finley in a second because he's clearly, you know, uh, a dominant figure in in, in sort of the, the rest of this story, right? But um, <clears throat> it seems, uh, my understanding is that, um, you know, that uh, the league, right, to your, to your point, was... Um, almost going out of their way, probably because of television and nationalism or national footprint uh, uh, endeavors or, or desires uh, to keep the team from moving. And um, not that didn't sit with uh, Van Gerbig very well to the point of uh, bringing a uh, restraint of trade uh, case against the NHL, which um, I guess was a result of his inability or uh, his uh, being precluded from moving to Vancouver. And uh, according to my notes, or maybe some of the stuff that you wrote, uh, the case itself wasn't settled until 1974. Yeah, that's right. It was um, uh, Van Gerbig was was obviously upset that he couldn't move the team. He just wanted to get rid of this albatross that he'd been uh, saddled with. And um, every time he tried to move the team, the NHL or the other owners who needed to, I believe it was maybe eight out of the other uh, 11 owners or uh, whichever it was at the time, it was maybe 75% needed to approve. They never could get the, uh, the, the number of votes required. Um, and that upset him to the point where he decided to sue the NHL for, uh, because they weren't allowing him to move the franchise. He felt it was his franchise. He could do what he wanted with it, uh, but he was uh, unable to move it. And so this entire time he's losing money trying to find someone who's going to buy this team and keep it in the Bay Area but um, it wasn't easy to sell a team um, that was losing money and to also keep it in the same place where it was losing money. So in the end, it took uh, a good five or six years, wasn't until 1974, when the, the, the issue was finally settled and Van Gerbig was officially uh, through with the NHL. Yeah, it's interesting because I think uh, part of the, uh, uh, the finding in 74 was that um, the league was considered a single entity, which 
you know, still reverberates today in professional sports. If anybody's a fan of uh, Major League Soccer, right, and uh, and arguably now becoming a very contentious uh, issue uh, with relation to the various minor leagues underneath Major League Soccer, um, it is a single entity. I mean, it literally was created as a single entity, perhaps with uh, rulings like this and against the Sherman Act uh, in mind uh, as a defense against being um, – uh, accused of being collusionary and or uh, restraint of trade. So it's a this is a common uh, refrain that we've heard uh, time and time again, and, and, and in many cases, and actually not fully solved. But they clearly they didn't stop stop Van Gerbig from from continuing to try. Uh, before we get to Finley, though, in 1970, there was this little uh, dalliance, an actual sale uh, to an entity called Transnational Communications, which um, bought the team apparently uh, in '69 and. Interesting in that uh, the investors in this um, in this entity, which looks to me to be a uh, was a sort of a sports uh, kind of investment vehicle. But uh, you had folks like uh, broadcaster Pat Summerall uh, involved. You had Whitey Ford, former Yankee great. Uh, and I think even transnational at the time uh, also on the Boston Celtics. So it looked like they had at least some wherewithal and or uh, momentum or or or. Uh, uh, you know, uh, goods, shall we say, uh, to be a, uh, a quality owner of this team, but didn't happen that way, did it? Yeah, it seemed every time that some owner came in to buy the field, there was all some sort of problem with them. And transnational communications, uh, from what Frank Selke had told me, and what was also written in, in other books, um, they were a bit smoke and mirrors, I guess you could say. They, they didn't have maybe as much money as they were claiming to have. And, uh, and it's true, they, they said they owned the Boston Celtics. They had different partners like Pat Summerall and White, Whitey Ford. Uh, but in, in the end, they just didn't have enough money to keep the Seals going. Um, and the tenants did go up in the season that they owned the team in, in 69 70. The tenants went up about 6200 per game. But even that was still dead last in the NHL. There was no way they were going to make any money. Um, even making the playoffs, the Seals ended up losing money because they weren't selling out those those playoff games. Uh, so transnational, they only lasted about a year with the Seals because they just didn't have the capital to back them up. Um, most expansion teams in those early days didn't make a lot of money. They were uh, they were building their franchise. The attendance was a little bit lower than it was in the the, the established original six teams, and the Seals were uh, were number one on that list of uh, troubled franchises. So, um, if anyone was going to own the team, they need to have deep pockets, and Transnational Communications certainly didn't. Okay, friends, sorry for the interruption. Just wanted to quickly remind you that today's episode of Good Seats Still Available is brought to you by our friends at Audible, the premier provider of digital audiobooks with over 180,000 titles to choose from in just about every genre you could think of. Audible titles play on iPhone, Kindle, Android, and more than 500 devices and MP3 players for listening anytime, anywhere. And for a limited time, my audience can listen to a free download of any book that they choose, as well as get a 30-day free trial when you go to audibletrial.com slash goodseats. That's audibletrial.com slash goodseats. And you can choose from over 180,000 titles, as we said, including uh, one that I'm listening to right now. It's called The Ten Gallon War by John Eisenberg. That's the story of the NFL's Cowboys, the AFL's Texans, and the feud for Dallas's pro football future. Um, another one on my list, which I have yet to download, but is on my queue, uh, that could be interesting to our audience here is called the National Forgotten League by Dan Daly, entertaining stories and observations from pro football's first 50 years. Those are just two of the many thousands of titles to choose from, and not just in sports history, but you name the genre that uh, you might want to listen to and Audible's got it. By the way, two, uh, two guests perhaps that we'll have on the show, hopefully sometime soon. But again... Go to audibletrial.com slash good seats for your free 30 day trial as well as your free audiobook download to try it out for yourself. Again, that's audibletrial.com slash good seats. And now back to our conversation. All right. So Van Gerbic then still, again, retains ownership of this team and now has to figure out how to put it back on the market. Um, and we all know by 1970, 
man by the name of Charles O. Finley. Uh, Charlie Finley buys the team. But uh, maybe the story or the backstory of how he actually got to that ownership uh, is important because there was a bidding war of sorts between Finley and uh, the uh, roller derby imp- impresario named Jerry Seltzer, who uh, apparently, upon all accounts, had a better offer and a better plan for reviving or, or propping up this team. Yet Finley wound up winning the battle. How uh, you want to give a little bit of uh, uh, insight as to sort of how the scramble, I guess, for this uh, Seals franchise uh, came about. Yeah, you can even say that the moment that Charlie Finley came in was the moment the franchise really um, turned a corner in a, in a, in a very bad way. Um, Finley, as you know, was very controversial in baseball um, and uh, later in, in basketball. He was a um, a very odd sort of figure, uh, very deep pockets, lots of money. Um, on the other hand, you have Jerry Seltzer, who was the, the roller derby king at the time, um, he was very, very professional. He had a great plan. I think he had maybe like a 100-page plan or something like that uh, to uh, take the skills a success. He knew what he wanted to do. Um, he had everything thought out. And um, by any source of the imagination, he would have been a, a very, very solid owner. But the NHL didn't see him that way. They, th- they saw him as being a bit flamboyant. They saw him as being associated with, uh, you know, roller derby was not really considered to be very high class. It's kind of low brow, almost like professional wrestling or something. They, they didn't like him being in their nice uh, button-down community. Um, you know, the, the NHL owners were very prim and proper at the time, and Jerry Seltzer seemed like he was maybe a bit wilder and maybe – um, a little bit more controversial. Little did they know that if they wanted controversy, Finley was the one to go to. And um, Charles Finley might have been a, a bit older. He might have been uh, more successful in, uh, in, in in baseball, for example, uh, and he was involved with a more traditional sport. But if anything, Finley was much more controversial uh, than, than Seltzer ever could have been. Finley, whenever he presented his plan, it was about as bare bones as you could get. It was a, a, a page or two. And um, he really didn't have any idea what to do with this team. He wasn't familiar with hockey. Um, his first conference, he even said to the, the crowd, you can see it in Mark Gretzfield's documentary, he says, I know absolutely nothing about hockey, which is the last thing you want to hear from your new owner. And um, a guy like Jerry Seltzer, who uh, I'm not sure how familiar with, he was with hockey, but he had a plan. He'd done a lot of research. He was ready to own this team and make it a success. Finley had absolutely no idea. And... Uh, but he also had some connections with some of the NHL owners and uh, other people in the NHL at the time, uh, notably Munson Campbell, who was uh, a friend of the, uh, the Norrises who owned um, the, the, the Detroit Red Wings at the time. So he was able to kind of get his foot in the door that way. He knew a couple of people, and that ultimately that's uh, who they chose. They decided Finley was the one they were going to go with. But in in the end, they really, really should have avoided that um, um, that uh, decision because Finley was just not the right owner at the time or ever. Yeah, it's interesting because Seltzer, <clears throat> who uh, whose father actually kind of got the whole roller derby thing started, and he kind of then elevated it to a even more of a modern day sort of art. Um, you know, Seltzer not only was sort of the they called him the commissioner or the commish of of. Uh, of roller derby, he was also. I guess he was probably more of an entrepreneur, right? I, I my understanding is that uh, in his bid, he had uh, uh, the support and/or financial uh, backing of four of the uh, original or, or current uh, AFL uh, football uh, owners, right? Which probably also uh, was another sort of scent of um, uh, rock the boatness, shall we say, uh, to the state uh, NHL uh, ownership. But uh, you know, Seltzer also gets some credit too because, in addition to uh, elevating a roller derby kind of to a national kind of phenomenon. He also uh, created a, a television network or uh, of sorts uh, so that uh, the uh, the popularity of it uh, was, uh, you know, a- across the United States. And, and you know, you have to obviously hindsight is twenty twenty. But uh, if you're thinking about how to keep a sport sort of in the national spotlight and, and, and frankly, recognizing that television, a huge part of it and obviously became a, a much bigger part of it in the years down the road. And arguably the whole reason why the Seals became an NHL franchise in the first place because of CBS's insistence on a, on a West Coast franchise. Um, you know, again, you'd think that Seltzer had the edge because he understood the medium of television 
and was working to perfection with his uh, his roller derby uh, franchises. Yeah, absolutely. He would have been, uh, at least it seems on paper, he would have been a very, very good owner. Just the fact that he was, he was prepared, he knew what he was doing. He had success in the past. Um, but uh, you, you see that a lot in, in, uh, in sports. Now, the more flamboyant owners don't get along with the other more uh, traditional button-down owners, and it creates lots of conflict. And sometimes that's the reason why um, potentially good owners get rejected is because the personalities clash a little bit. And certainly in, in 1970, uh, there, was, there was definitely this, this clash that existed between these, uh, these younger, more modern, hip sort of uh, you know, young entrepreneurs and the more traditional button-down owners and millionaires that, uh, that existed then. Um, it, the line was definitely a lot more drawn at the time than it is now. All right. So let's talk about then Charlie Finley then now owning the team. You obviously mentioned his uh, infamous press conference. And and again, we uh, recommend uh, Mark Gretschmill's uh, film, which is available on iTunes. Uh, you can find a link to it from our site, of course. And uh, you'll see uh, literally the clip from that where Finley famously decries his uh, lack of knowledge about the sport of hockey. Um, but keeping in the tradition uh, or the uh, the now becoming tradition of the SEALs, um, not before the season, uh, but uh, two games into the 1970-71 season. Guess what? The name changed again from Oakland to now what is called the California Golden Seals. And I, if I have this correct, they were also rumored to be considering Bay Area for the name, too. Yeah, that was uh, the original Finley plan. He uh, thought this would be a great idea called the Bay Area Seals. But uh, uh, someone must have convinced him otherwise to change his name, change the name to uh uh, California Golden Seals. Not that that was necessarily much better, but um, that's what he went with in, in the end. And um, to, to reflect this this wonderful new name for his team, um, he decided to change the the team's colors completely. Uh, the the first few years, the team's colors were a bit drab. It was like a, like a dark forest green and uh, nice uniforms, but maybe a little on the drab side. And Finley, who loved um, gold and green and white, uh, needed to have that, the same combination on the Oakland Athletics uniforms. He had to have that on his California Golden Seals. And so this was what the uniforms looked like, and they stood out like a sore thumb no matter where they went. These were color schemes that had, that color scheme that had never been seen before in professional hockey. Uh, but that was his idea of um, you know turning the franchise around and giving this flashy new name, these flashy new uniforms, uh, not to mention green and gold skates that first year. And um, it didn't take very long for the rest of the league to really uh, ridicule the, the Seals and their poor players for um, these awful uniforms they had to wear. And the team responded in kind by being the worst record in the NHL that uh, season. They absolutely failed the first year. Uh, is this when the white skates, the infamous white skates came about, or was that uh, later on? Uh, the white skates came in the following year. In uh, I believe it was in January of '71. Um, uh, Philly decided that uh, you know um, he, he he in the beginning he had thought about putting his team in white skates. Um, there was a one preseason game where he had asked um, the, the the team to put on the white skates, and uh, he only had the one pair that was available. But he asked. Uh, Bill Torrey to tell the players that uh, he wants someone to wear these white skates during this exhibition game to see how they look. And uh, so that's what they decided to do. Uh, Gary Jarrett was the, the poor soul who decided to uh, uh, to accept the, the offer and wear the white skates during the game. Um, and uh, in the end, Finley said, uh, you know, these look like crap. Um, we're going to put this idea aside. Uh, we'll just go with the green and gold skates. This is better anyway. But then the following year, in January of 1971, uh, Finley decided to revisit the idea of white skates, but this time he wanted all his players to wear them. Um, he started giving them to him uh, during practice to kind of break them in, and then finally in January they decided uh, he decided it was time that they would wear them in the in a game. And uh, at first it actually uh, it worked out. The first few games they won uh, with the white skates, but the the players realized after a little while that um, you know you'd get uh, scuff marks and uh, and, uh, and and uh, and puck marks on on the skates there be they weren't pristine white anymore so you need to paint them over and over again uh, after every game or every couple of games and as the season went on those skates started getting heavier and heavier and I don't know if it's any relation but the team which was 
playing pretty well at that time uh, before the white skates came in. Uh, all of a sudden, around February, they start to lose more and more games, and they had a horrible last month. It might have been because the skates were getting heavier and heavier. The players certainly, uh, they all agreed that they were um, getting heavier by the game. Whether it actually affected their play, I'm not really sure, but it definitely shows that if you look at the, the standings and their um, their win-loss record, it got worse and worse as the season went on, and it was after the white skates came in that they start to, uh, to start to affect their play, seemingly. Well, the conspiracy about uh, the heavier paint load on the skates to, to drag them into. That's interesting. I mean, it's interesting stuff, but yet it doesn't seem all that odd when you consider the entire crazy story of this team, right? Including, it seems, the uh, their, their ability to draft, or maybe that was just simply just bad luck. But uh, it seems to me a real turning point and maybe an indicative one uh, was their... Um, their 1970 and 71 draft pick swap with Montreal, which in 71 Montreal turned the, the, uh, uh, the valuable first pick in the draft because of the seals uh, uh poor showing the year before to pick uh, a transformative player in the guy in the form of uh, Guy Lafleur, Right. And in many respects, uh, just indicative of the seals, woeful luck and, or, uh, uh, approach to uh, to life, uh, arguably Guy Lafleur, one of the more celebrated players of his time, and and arguably could have been a seal, and uh, I guess referred to as more of a lop, the most one of the more lopsided trades uh, in NHL history. Yeah, the the Montreal Canadiens um, general manager Sam Pollock was um, pro- probably the greatest general manager of all time. He was. Uh, very astute, very intelligent, and he knew that these expansion teams were desperate for talent. They would do almost anything um, to, to to get talent right away. And Pollock, who had talent galore in his minor league system, could afford to to give away some um, some unwanted players, some uh, some players in the minor leagues, and uh, build through the draft. Um, for a long time, the, the first few years of the draft, I believe up to about 1969 or 1970, the Montreal Canadiens were allowed to pick um, the, the first two uh, French Canadian players uh, or the first two players in Quebec every year. It was, um, it was a right that they had as, as a team. And then I believe it was 1970 or maybe it was 71 where they, the NHL decided, okay, you guys are way too strong. Um, it, it, we understand that you need to keep bringing the French Canadian players to, um, you know, for, for your image, and uh, you're the Montreal Canadiens, after all. Um, we just can't let this happen anymore. The times have changed. Uh, we can't let you monopolize the two best players in the entire province of Quebec. So um, by 1971, Montreal didn't have the right to pick Lafleur just like that, like they normally would have had. So Sam Paul had to finagle a couple of deals uh, to try to get that first overall pick. Um, or maybe the second overall pick, because Marcel Dion was the second overall pick, and he would have been just as good a, a pick anyway. But Pollock knew that there was no way Montreal was going to finish last, or even close to last in the standings. And that was a requirement to get the first overall pick at the time. Uh, there was no draft lottery like there is now. So Pollock had made a trade in 1970. He said, we'll send you um, the, the Oakland Seals. We'll trade you our first-round pick in 1970, if you give us your first round pick in 1971, the year that Pollock knew Lafleur was going to be drafted, uh, and so the Seals said, "Well, sure, what the hell? It's not really much of a big deal. We're just trading one first round pick for another. What's the harm in that?" Um, the the NHL draft was not really seen as being as important as it is now. Uh, a lot of teams were trading away draft picks left, right, and center, not really thinking about their long term future. Teams wouldn't be stupid enough to do these kinds of things now. So Pollock made this deal, and he ended up um, having the Seals pick in his possession. The only condition now was that to get the first overall pick, the Seals had to finish last. And the Seals, during that 70-71 season, the, the first year Finley took over, weren't playing that badly for the first half of the year. They were, they were near the bottom, but they weren't really lagging behind anyone. There was always a chance that they could even make the playoffs that year. So... Pollock decided to trade Ralph Backstrom to Los Angeles in order to uh, boost the Kings a little bit and help them move ahead of the Seals. And in the end, that's what happened. The, the, the Kings ended up finishing ahead of the Seals. The Seals ended up finishing last that year. And so 
by rights, they should have gotten the first overall pick, but they traded to Montreal. So Montreal was able to pick uh, Gilles for the first overall um, first overall selection. Yeah, I, at what point, uh, as a Seals fan, and I know you and nor I were fans at the time, we weren't uh, conscious of them at the time, uh, at what point do you realize that this is just something that is unshakable in terms of your luck and your abilities to you know succeed as a franchise in this league? In, in, in a way, it's, it's unfortunate, but in um, like uh, as you look at the, the list of players who were drafted in, in that year, or even in 1970, when when the um, the Seals had Montreal's pick, um, you, it, it's easy to uh, to feel bad for the Seals and say, well, you know, they should have had Guy Lafleur. Um, you know, th- this was a pick that um, fell right into their, their lap, and they just let it go. But in the end, there were lots of other good players that were available later in the draft. It was a very deep draft. There was tons of great players that were available, and they just didn't pick them. So. You have to blame scouting a little bit in, in that sense that they could they could have uh, turned their second round pick into a, into a home run into into a winner, but they didn't pick the the right player. They they went with someone who didn't have a very long career. Um, so in, in a way, it's unfortunate the Seals missed out on Lafleur or even on Marcel Dion. Uh, but there were lots of good players that were available in in those drafts in seventy seventy one uh, uh, and some of the other years when they traded their first round picks away. There was really no reason why they could have um, not picked someone more successful. Uh, so in a way, scouting has a lot to do with it. Uh, luck has part of it as well, but um, scouting has uh, a big role to play in, in the SEALs' ultimate failure. Well, it seems that uh, Finley and uh, and his uh, management team uh, certainly tried to pull out some stops, right, to do at least some innovative promotional things to keep sort of the, the fans somewhat interested and maybe uh, – give them a reason or an excuse to come to the games, even though they were so relatively woeful. I mean, they were in the basement, I guess, for the next three seasons after that. And look, I guess, too, with the arrival of the WHA, uh, you even had some players that were uh, tempted uh, by this uh, newfound uh, checkbook uh, spree of this new interloping league. Uh, you know, Finley was uh, quite miserly and, and didn't want to match any of those uh of those offers either. So uh, maybe you can kind of describe the next couple of years in terms of both promotional as well as Finley's kind of tight fistedness, I guess, against this sort of new uh, free spending uh, competition uh, to, you know, to keep this franchise going. Yeah. Most of the players, when they were in the Bay area, they actually, they really liked playing in, in Oakland. They thought it was a really nice place to play. Uh, the fans they had were just tremendous. They, they had great relationships with the fans and, uh, there, there just wasn't a lot of them. The players themselves loved the Bay Area. They loved living there. They loved the fact the weather was nice uh, during the winter time. It was very relaxing. Um, but be- in, in large part because of Finley, they decided to leave the, what was a very comfortable area and a nice situation that they had. Uh, you have to remember the 71-72 seals just before the WHA came in were on the verge of making the playoffs. They just missed the playoffs that year, and they had an excellent, excellent young team with players like Jill Malosh, and they had Dick Redmond, and uh, Bobby Sheehan, Jerry Pinder, and, and players who were really on the rise. It seemed like this was a team that was going to contend in, in a few years, or at the very least be a, a playoff contender. Uh, but Finley did a lot of things that just drove players nuts, or that just made them wonder, why are we in this situation? Uh, there was, there was um, a promotion he did called Barber Night, uh, in the seventy uh, seventy one season, and Finley, in his infinite wisdom, believed that uh, um, if we invited a whole bunch of Bay Area barbers to uh, to a special night at the Coliseum, and uh, uh, we'll, we'll we'll provide them with dinner, and we'll meet the players, this is going to be great because the barbers are going to tell all their customers. Uh, about how great it was to be uh, to meet Charlie Finley, how great it was to see this hockey game, and um, this was his idea of a great promotion. Well, in the end, the, the Barber Night turned out was it was a great success. They sold out, but that was the only sellout for a long time, if not the only sellout that season. Um, so this Barber Night idea was just a, a, a terrible idea. The money that he probably spent promoting it, uh, there was nothing that came out of it really. Um, he also had a live seal as a mascot the, the first year, and uh, all the thing did was lie on the ice because, well, seals like lying on cold ice, so it wasn't moving very much. 
Um, and uh, of course, there was the white skates and the, uh, the, the the green and gold skates that he thought were just tremendous promotional ideas. But none of these things worked. They were just uh, silly, silly uh, ideas. So when the World Hockey Association came along in 1972, you have players who um, they like staying in the Bay Area, but they're being offered sometimes uh, you know, double their salary to jump to this rival league that they're trying to start up. And um, they they went to Finley. They asked him like, "Look, this this other league wants to offer us, uh, uh, you know, thirty or forty thousand dollars or more to to play. Would you give us a little bit more money? And if you do, we'll we we'd, we'd like to stay in Oakland. But in the end, Finley would offer them a five hundred or a thousand dollar raise, and he would say, "Well, the World Hockey Association, Association is not really a threat. They're not going to laugh. I'm not worried about my players going there." Well, they all went. <laughs> They, they all thought it was a better idea. The World Hockey Association was guaranteeing contracts. They were giving these, uh, they were treating players like they were human beings, and they were negotiating much more fairly, and they were assuring these players were going to have um, financial success for, for years to come, and they were, were going to have money for their retirement. At least that's what they, they, they believed. And uh, Philly just didn't get that. He thought that by giving players um, these matching green and gold suitcases that they would take with them everywhere on the road and give them these, uh, these ugly green jackets that they would all go on the road with at the same time. He thought players would love these, these things, uh, giving them $300 bonuses for shutouts and for hat tricks, uh, buying them new shoes and steak dinners. He thought, like, this is what players wanted. This is what uh, made them proud to be a member of the team. Players needed money. They were, they were being horribly underpaid at the time. And when someone was coming along offering them um, almost double their salaries, if not more than double their salaries in some cases, they were going to go because they, they need to think about their families as well and uh, about their futures. Uh, one of the players that I talked to, um, his name was Brian Campbell. He never played for the Seals, but he was a World Hockey Association player. And that's the reason why he left. He said, no, I love the game, and we all love the game. That's not the reason why we, we left. Uh, we left because you know, we got to think about our futures as well. We're getting paid a lot more money, and as a hockey player, we're not going to be playing into our 40s and 50s. We're gonna be, we could be retired at 30 or 35. We need money to, uh, to keep us going. And so the World Hockey Association was, was very tempting to a lot of players who um, wanted that financial stability. And in the case of the Seals, you know, having to put up with white skates and uh, green jackets and green and gold suitcases uh, wasn't terribly appealing to, to a lot of these players. And, um, and that's one of the reasons why the, the team failed in, in, the, in the end. Um, all the best players, they were all offered contracts, and a good majority of them decided to take those and, uh, and, and just play for different organizations in, in this, this new league. And it's interesting when you especially juxtapose that with the um, <clears throat> relative success of his other franchise, the Oakland A's at the time in baseball. Uh, you, you wonder if um, if either I if that was, hey, it's working for the A's. Why can't it also work for the Seals? Or perhaps he wasn't giving the Seals as much of attention because the A's were doing so well. It's a little bit of both, I would say. Like, he, he definitely didn't give the, the Seals uh, any attention. It was. Um, the seals were i wouldn't even they weren't even a hobby for them they were they were secondary his his priority was the oakland a's uh, definitely and um but he treated the a's and the seals very similarly the the idea of the, the uniform colors were exactly the same the a's wore the white cleats the seals wore the white skates um the oakland a's were one of the lowest paid teams if not the lowest paid team in the league um and w- when free agency came to baseball, I believe it was 1975 or 76, all of a sudden, all their best players, Reggie Jackson, Catfish Hunter, Vida Blue, they all decided to leave for the same reason. They just weren't getting paid as much as they were worth, and they were getting tired of, of Finley's um, eccentric behavior and his, uh, his crazy promotions. I mean, Finley could be a very, very warm and generous human being when he wanted to be. He was um, you could call him Charlie. There was no uh, Mr. Finley. He was Charlie. You could uh, speak him on a first name basis. He could be very warm, very fatherly, and very very kind. Uh, for example, giving the, the shout out bonuses and buying players new shoes for a big win or something. Like that. He could be very generous, but um, he was so cheap when it came to 
um, upping salaries and and uh, and keeping up with the times, and he could be very crass, he could be very bigoted at times as well. And um, so players, when they, they had the opportunity to leave, they all left um, in both the sports, in hockey and in baseball, they all left pretty much uh, on the spot at the same time uh, the nucleus of both those teams left. And in both cases, the franchises, the A's and the Seals, uh, sank to the basement. In uh, The Oakland A's were three-time World Series champs. And once uh, free agency hit and all their big stars left, the A's, uh, for, for a couple of years, sank to the basement. And it took years for them to, to recover from that. Yeah, and I, I remember vividly uh, stories in Sports Illustrated of the team that you know was drawing like three, 400 people a game uh, at that point. Um, all right, but so so Finley loses patience, right? And um, he, um, you know, he sell he tries to sell the uh, the team, uh, I guess, to a group in Indianapolis that was rejected by the league, uh, and then it and then the league basically takes on the ownership of the team as a result. Is there any sort of interesting story there, or was that you know was was Finley being similarly blocked by the NHL, be, uh, as was evidenced earlier, because they really wanted to keep a team in the Bay Area, or or any sort of interesting stories around that attempt to sell the team before the league took ownership? Well, from what I read, the NHL was never going to let the Seals move as long as that antitrust suit was uh, was, was still ongoing. Ah. Um, so them going to Indianapolis was, was probably never going to happen, although uh, they, they might have found a way to do it. But uh, they, they had no interest in moving the team to Indianapolis, uh, even though it was, it was rumored that's where Finley wanted to move them. Um, so I'm sorry. So, so the, was, I'm sorry. So the uh, anti, the anti, I'm sorry. The antitrust thing, though, then was actually was actually a component to why this didn't happen. So the fact that it was still ongoing, even though Finley had nothing really to do with it, it was still uh, perhaps uh, in the way of of making that transition or that sale happen. Yeah, that's right. The, the seals weren't going to go anywhere as long as that suit uh, was was still ongoing, and. Um, what happened in the end was uh, Finley, they, they offered him a couple of times to, to buy the franchise off from the, the NHL. I mean, offered to buy the franchise off because they just wanted to get rid of him at this point. Um, in the 73-74 season, Finley ended up having a heart attack, and uh, his, his doctors advised him to start selling off his team. So the Seals were, were one of the teams he decided to, uh, to let go of. Uh, the Memphis Tams also of the uh, the American Basketball Association also he decided to let them go as well. He kept the Oakland A's. Um, they were they were really his baby. Like he he did care passionately about the A's. That was really his team. Uh, but the other franchise he let them go, and uh, the NHL and the buying team from Finley. Uh, Finley still had to make a profit off of the uh, off of the sale, which is unbelievable considering how um, poorly attendance had fallen to by this point. Uh, but even he had made money off the seals when he sold them to the league, and uh, the, the the seals ended up becoming really an orphaned team uh, owned by all the other um, NHL owners. So the league then now has this team. How long did they operate it uh, once um, uh, they took it over from Finley? Was it a full season? Uh, this would have been near the end of the 73-74 season. I think maybe in February or March it was. Uh, I think it was in February when they officially bought the team. And uh, and then they started to find an, um, someone to take over uh, ownership of the team. But they really didn't find anyone t- until the end of the 74-75 season when Mel Swig, the uh, San Francisco uh, um, hotel uh, owner, um, he, he uh, owned the, the Fairmont Hotel in uh, San Francisco, um, he ended up buying the franchise, um, and he was the owner during the team's last season in Oakland. And the uh, the plan around that, though, revolved around a uh, a a uh, a new arena in San Francisco. Correct. The um, the arena plans. Uh, Mel Swig had Mel Swig had a good plan on what he wanted to do with the franchise. He he would have been a good owner. Um, had circumstances been a little bit different. When he bought the team, immediately he had the idea of building a new uh, arena in San Francisco called the Yerba Buena Center. Uh, This was supposed to be... The vision he had for it was very similar to a lot of the stadiums you see nowadays. Um, I'm not sure how familiar you are with with, uh, with Ottawa, but uh, um, the... um, 
Ottawa now has a, uh, a stadium for its uh, uh, CFL franchise. And around the stadium, they, uh, they decided to, to revamp it. They decided to, to renovate it. Uh, and around it, they built uh, a whole bunch of restaurants and uh, a promenade and uh, parkland. And it's a, it's, it's a place where you can go to spend almost your entire day before you go to the game. And after you go to the game, you can go grab a beer and uh, just, just have fun. The Yerba Buena Center, from what Gary Simmons was telling me, sounded like it was very similar to that. There was going to be some restaurants around. It was going to be a, a beautiful new 17 or 18,000 seat rink um, in San Francisco where the team should have been placed in the, first, uh, in, in the very beginning. Um, this was what he wanted to do. And uh, originally, the mayor of San Francisco, his name was Joe Alioto, who was a close friend of, of Swig and his family's, Joe Alioto said um, that um, they were going to approve this, this rink, and uh, no problem. You guys have uh, your rink. It'll be ready in a couple of years. Um, congratulations, and uh, you're on your way. Well, Joe Alioto ended up losing the San Francisco mayoral election in 1976, and so all of those plans ended up changing when the incoming mayor, uh, George Moscone, came in. He and his council decided to revisit the arena plans and in the end, they decided that they weren't going to go with this uh, this new rink, and they turned it down. Uh, they uh, d- decided um, that the Seals would have to stay at the Coliseum in Oakland. And by this point, the Coliseum had really gotten too small. It only held about 12,000 people. Not that they were filling it up anyway, but if they were ever going to um, survive in the NHL, they needed a bigger rink. And they needed a rink out of Oakland. They needed to go back to San Francisco. That was re- where the team should have been placed. Uh, at the very, very beginning, and um, because this arena plan fell through, um, they had no choice but to move the team somewhere, and that somewhere ended up being Cleveland, which wasn't really the greatest decision, but uh, they needed to move the team. There was no way they could have stayed in Oakland much longer. Um, Attendance was starting to rise, but it still wasn't enough to to keep the team uh, in Oakland. It was still the worst attendance in the league. Um, but there was potential that the team was starting to turn a corner at that point. And you, you could argue that maybe if they had kept the team in Oakland, the uh, attendance could have risen a little bit. Maybe they could have survived a few more years, but we'll, we'll never know. They they decided to just uh, um, cut their ties with Oakland at that point and move to Cleveland. And, and two two things there, I think, uh, as a backdrop to that uh, move to Cleveland. One, uh, I believe, was the settlement of that uh, lingering case, the antitrust case, right? Uh, and it seemed yeah. like the league, either for legal reasons or just for, I guess, accumulated frustration reasons, uh, now no longer opposed relocation of the team. Um and second, uh, two minority owners who became much more um, of a story in the years to follow uh, in Swig's uh, uh, acquisition of the team, uh, the Gund brothers, who I guess were instrumental uh, in convincing him and or whomever was thinking about where to put the team going forward to move him to Cleveland. Yeah, the Swig brothers were, were from Cleveland. Um, so they, they thought it was a, a great location for a team, and um, it, it wasn't a good location for a team in, uh, in, in a certain way because uh, Cleveland had a long hockey history, still does. Um, they, they had the American League uh, Cleveland Barons, who were very successful. They had uh, lots of um, championships, and they had many, many great players, like uh, Johnny Bauer, for example, and Fred Glover, who played there. Uh, there was a, a long history of, um, of success in, in Cleveland. But the, the problem with Cleveland in 1976 was that the, the rink where the, the Seals were going to play was located 26 miles out of town. And it was, it was only a two-lane highway to get there. So in the middle of winter, it was very difficult to convince people to go from Cleveland and drive all the way out to the middle of nowhere to watch a hockey game and then drive all the way back uh, in, in the dead of night. So the idea of moving to Cleveland, it, yes, it's, it, was a, it was a good hockey market, but downtown Cleveland would have been a good hockey market. Where they put the rink was so far out of town that it was almost impossible to get uh, large crowds. They, they never once sold out the Coliseum, uh, the Richfield Coliseum, while the team was in Oakland, uh, while the team was in uh, Cleveland, sorry. And um, there, were, there were signs that this was a bad idea in the first place because the World Hockey Association had also put a team in Cleveland uh, a few years earlier, and 
they ended up moving out in at the end of uh, 1976. So, in a way, the seals. Um, they made the decision to move to Cleveland because there was no more competition. The, the, the World Hockey Association Cleveland Crusaders were gone, so the Richfield Coliseum became available. But in the end, that was a, a, a bad decision. They should have seen that attendance was bad at the Coliseum with the Crusaders. It wasn't going to get any better with the Seals. Yeah, at some point I want to do a show uh, specifically on uh, the two years of, uh, as the Barons because I think there's some interesting little uh, intricacies to that story too, some of which you've – You've touched upon. Well, okay, so let's uh, maybe just segue as our last sort of little mini segment here. Uh, The guns by this point are now the majority owners and um, uh, basically decide to uh, uh, merge uh, what is now the Barons into the Minnesota North Stars and sort of continuing the torturous history of this Seals franchise, right? Even this wasn't even clean and clear and straightforward, right? Because there seems to be it was a merger of into a team that was itself struggling, the North Stars, and then the Stars wound up moving to Dallas, and then uh, and then there was a swap later on, and and so ironically, in a very torturous way, though the Guns wind up somehow uh, getting back to the Bay Area via the San Jose Sharks of today. Um, I don't know if there's any if you can sort of wrap that up into a bow, but um, maybe you could. Yeah, the, uh, well, the, the Barons and North Stars merged in 1978 uh, because they were both struggling franchises. And um, someone came up with the idea of putting these two franchises together and uh, keeping the best players of each and making them into one team. And then uh, Cleveland, which was the one that had the lower attendance date, were pushed to the wayside and they kept Minnesota, which had a, a rich hockey history uh, in the NHL. Uh, they just fall on hard times those last few years. But doing that, they ended up um, having a bit of a resurgence. The North Stars became a very successful franchise in the 80s. Uh, they had a Stanley Cup uh, final appearance in 81 and 91. They lost both times, but they, uh, they had shown some, uh, some, some success at least. Um, but then uh, around uh, 91, the, uh, the, the Gunn brothers had decided that they wanted to take the San Jose expansion franchise that the NHL was, uh, was, was hoping to, uh, to, to, to sell. Um, and the Guns wanted to go back to San Jose, but they had the Minnesota North Stars. Um, and they didn't really, they, they were hoping to just move the North Stars to San Jose in the end, but the NHL wanted to put an expansion team there. There was more money for, uh, in an expansion team than in just relocating a team. So to placate the, the Gun Brothers, the NHL said, uh, okay, what we'll do is uh, we'll let you have the, the San Jose expansion franchise and we'll have a sort of a demerger where in the expansion draft, you will get to select some players as well for your, your new Sharks team, um, and essentially uh, reversing the merger that happened in 1978. So that's how the San Jose Sharks came into, into, uh, into play. Uh, the North Stars continued for a few more years. They found a new owner. Uh, they ended up moving to Dallas uh, a couple of years down the road. Um, but that's how the, the, uh, the San Jose Sharks came into existence was uh, because uh, – the NHL wanted to put a team back in San Francisco in the, in the Bay uh, to begin with, but the Guns really wanted that franchise. So they ended up getting it um, and um, uh, with a bit of a sweetheart deal to get extra players than an expansion team would normally get. So as you look through the family tree and the lineages and, uh, and the history of both the Dallas Stars and the San Jose Sharks, um, you need to understand that uh, the California Golden Seals or the Oakland Seals or the California Seals or whatever the seals were in the NHL during these years, were part of that history, and uh, that's uh, why uh, we pursue these conversations uh, for this podcast. Uh, that is why we've had our guest Steve Courier uh, on this uh, this uh, here little show. Uh, the book is, uh, and arguably, we've only scratched the surface. This book is really cool. Uh, it's 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 it looks great, and it's it reads well, and it's a. Uh, uh, again, we're just not even getting to to half of the stories uh, about this team, some of the players, and all that stuff. But it's rich in history, uh, and it is a, it's a, it's a fun dive into into hockey history. It's called the California Golden Seals: A Tale of White Skates, Red Ink, and One of the NHL's Most Outlandish Teams. It is published by the University of Nebraska Press, uh, and it will look smart on your uh, on your coffee table and or your bookshelf and. Uh, but it's a fun read, uh, nonetheless. And uh, Steve, I, I, 
I can't thank you enough for uh, uh, allowing us to delve even further into this uh, SEAL story. Um, do you think you have uh, any other pursuits uh, in the back of your head, or has this one just exhausted you to no end, uh, where you might just sort of uh, retire on the on the uh, the sales of uh, of this tome? Well, I don't think I could possibly retire on the sales of the, of the, the tome for uh, simple reason I just enjoy it too much. It's uh, um, I think for the seals, I don't know if I could actually write anything else about them. I think it's uh, pretty much been said now, but. Uh, uh, I would, um, anything that I like to add, I usually put on my website right now, uh, uh, goldensealshockey.com. And, um, just like any other anecdotes I might get or, um, statistics or something, I, I usually just add them there. But, uh, one day I might, uh, go back and, and look at the, what I wrote on the seals and see if there's anything more I could possibly add. But, uh, I'd certainly be open to it. And, uh, also writing uh, other books about, um, you know, these, these little, um, Un, um, undeveloped corners of, uh, of of hockey history, especially in the 60s and 70s. Uh, um, other defunct franchise, I think, is where I'd like to go next and uh, just continue in that same sort of vein and uh, uh, just explore, you know, what hasn't been seen before. It's uh, it's um, it's too easy to write something about with the Montreal Canadiens and the Boston Bruins. It's, it's been done so many times. There's nothing more to say about them, but. Uh, these uh, these more obscure sort of franchises that you mentioned the WHA a while ago. There's so much that hasn't been unearthed yet that uh, it's uh, um, it, it makes it so much more fun to write about those kinds of things. So I think that's where I would uh, like to continue in the next uh, few years. All right, there it is. Our second uh, in-depth conversation about the uh, the franchise that uh, continues to befuddle. Uh, and amaze uh, the California Golden Seals of the National Hockey League from the late 60s and uh, early 1970s. And uh, again, rest assured, friends, that uh, the uh, Seals are not the only team in hockey that uh, we will be exploring as the weeks and months uh, progress. Uh, Plenty of uh, NHL and especially WHA uh, conversations uh, in the hopper. Uh, We obviously just try to take advantage of uh, promotional windows, in this case, uh, Steve's book, Uh, The California Golden Seals, a tale of white skates, red ink, and one of the NHL's most outlandish teams uh, is out uh, the last couple of weeks. And we wanted to take advantage of his availability uh, to um, to talk about uh, the story yet further, uh, as well as uh, uh, about the book as well uh, and his promotional efforts for it. Uh, I want to remind you that uh, our first ever episode um, was with our old friend Mark Gretschmill who we referenced a bunch of times in this chat. Uh, his uh, his film is still available on iTunes, and we encourage you to uh, get that film and this book. At the same time, you will get the perhaps full 360-degree uh, treatment about this uh, this team and this franchise. And frankly, you know, the, even the, even across those two conversations, uh, this one today and the, uh, the one we did with Mark back in, uh, in the earlier part of the year, uh, it, it frankly doesn't even still do justice to some of the other stories uh, that uh, need to be told and, and discovered again or rediscovered about the uh, the Golden Seals. Um, that uh, episode is episode number one. As you're going to goodseatsstillavailable.com, you'll scroll down there and find that episode with Mark. So uh, click through there to get the iTunes uh, download, and uh, uh, I'm sure he will appreciate that, as will you. And uh, obviously click to this episode. This is episode 36, we believe. Yes, on our website, goodseatsstillavailable.com, you will find a link to Steve Currier's book as well. It is published by uh, the University of Nebraska Press. Yes, it is 464 pages, uh, but it is a a fun read and it is uh, 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 hardly uh, a burden by any means. It's uh, it's, it's well-produced, it looks great, and it's got some great color schemes and photos and stuff. Uh, I highly encourage you to not only buy it, but read it and enjoy it. Um, let us see. So again, you know, the website, I've said it before. I'll say it again. It's good seats, still available.com. That's where you can find all of our old episodes. That's where you can find all of the links to the books and the other forms of media that we may reference during our conversations. Uh, it is also the place to make sure that you know where to find the show. Uh, we're on auto radio. We are on, uh, iTunes. We are on, where else? We're on uh, TuneIn. We are on uh, Google Play. We are on Stitcher. We are uh, we're available, which is about wherever podcasts and 
and those kinds of things are found. So wherever you get it, wherever, however you get it, like it, uh, review it, uh, certainly subscribe to it. We uh, we appreciate it. And you could also get the RSS feed. You can just go to our website every week. Whatever you want to do, uh, just do it for God's sakes. And, and thank you for doing so and listening. We we appreciate it. Tell your friends if you really like the show. That's the word of mouth thing is really important for us because this is a a niche activity for sure. And there's clearly always a team or a league that somebody always remembers. Uh, and once they discover that we've actually talked talked about it or potentially could talk about it, uh, you'd be surprised at how the passion sort of bubbles up to the surface. So we appreciate any good words that you'd like to share about that uh, to your friends as well. So please do that too. On Twitter, that's at Good Seat Still. On Instagram, we're at uh, Good Seat Still Available. Uh, like us uh, a lot if you'd like. On Facebook, we're, we're there too. Uh, and again, the website, of course. Uh, thank you also to our friends, not only at uh, Audible, our sponsor, but also Podfly Productions. Uh, the uh, crack team that puts together the elements of the show to make it sound somewhat decent. Uh, we appreciate Eric Begay, Jerry Payne, David Gregerson, and Corey Coates for their efforts. Podfly.net. If you want some podcasting uh, tips and help and support, they're the place to go. And we thank them for their help as always. Uh, I thank you for listening. We'll talk to you uh, next week with another fun-filled episode. God knows from what ep- from what uh, world of uh, Forgotten Sports we will talk about, but uh, I'm sure it will be interesting. Tune in and uh, find out, shall you? Uh, And I appreciate your uh, listening to this week, of course. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye.